I'm Kathy Matthews. I'm a, a pediatric neurologist at the University of Iowa who's doing a natural history study on dystrophic -like neuropathies. We are the Sultana, Victor, and Casey. And we have a son who's at kids camp right now, who's two and a half, named Theodore. Uh, and he has a mutation on PLM21. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Russ Butterfield. I'm a pediatric neurologist at uh, the University of Utah, Hawaii City. I run the neuromuscular clinic, so it's research program there. Hey, I'm Mariana Chiero. I'm a resident physical therapist, and I've been studying and working with congenital and myopathy diseases. And I've been my, having my post PhD in congenital diseases, especially how to assess the molecular but it's very, very function of this patient. And I'm Nico. I'm just a, a medical student volunteer at the conference. Mm -hmm. um, and for the people online, if you want to write any questions in the chat or anything, I'll be monitoring you too. Um, if you can't speak up or if you want to raise your hand or anything, I should have comments get heard as well. Or in this site, you, you could just talk. Yes. <laughs> so, Bill, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm uh, Bill Brown. I have a four-year-old daughter who's diagnosed with INPP5K, muscular dystrophy. Um, and let's see. Yeah, Warren, you came up. Yeah, sorry. I'm Warren Cooper. I'm a pediatric pulmonologist in Colorado. So since we have um, so family members, ask questions. <laughs> I guess um, I have one about pulmonology. Um, you've seen Theo come in, and he's right now. We don't believe there's any pulmonary issues, but um, in alpha dystrophic capacities, what should we be looking for? What does the progression look like? Um, yeah, I'm just interested. How old is he? Two and a half. And what's his um, cognitive function? Um, we're not sure yet. Um, He's nonverbal so far. Uh, he says like mom and dad, but those are the, pretty much the extent of his words that he can sign. Um, he can drive around a little car. bumper car pretty good. Um, so receptive, yeah. we think is really good, yeah. expressive. We'll see. And from what you tell me, it sounds like he hasn't had breathing issues like pneumonias or. No, he had one on um, respiratory hospitalization, but he was four months old. It was just a viral respiratory. He didn't have to be intubated. He did have some oxygen for a little while, some, some breathing treatment. treatment. But I kind of also feel like that's a normal thing for a four month old. Very, very common. Thank you. <laughs> All too common. There are any four month old. Where you do the lower muscle tone in general, being able to clear. Yeah. And does he have issues with um, with cough function? Can he can he get mucus out if he needs to cough? I think so. He's um telling that earlier in the group he does have a lot of oral secretions and he hasn't had any like pneumonias or anything like that. So um I think he probably does pretty well at clearing his yeah. secretions. Yeah. Were you in the pulmonary session? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Dr. Boo was talking about all of us aspirating. Yeah. <laughs> so, so managing oral secretions may or may not be a sign of increased risk for aspiration. Does he eat by well or drink by well? He, yeah, he does both. Um, we did have a swell study done. Um, did you as well? I smell, but um, seems like there's a lot of, like, his swallow is fine. It's like the motor part of getting the bullets back to the back of the throat to then start that swallow process. How loud is he? Does he think that loud sounds? He's just crying when he's like No, no, he cries. He's average kid, I think. Wait, so the 15 month old sister. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's uh, definitely not as loud as the sister, so I guess comparatively, I guess. Yeah. Slightly quieter, but like, you know, they called us earlier because 
He was crying and then starting to disturb others. So, yeah. so there's that. I also say he doesn't have like an in between. He's either like Quiet. looks like he's mouthing stuff and he's not like making any noises, or he's like yelling. How does he sleep? <laughs> that his sister also is the worst sister in the world. So, um, so anything compared to her is great. Yeah. Does <laughs> he sweat? What? Is he sweat? Yeah, he gets sweaty. Um, and I can't find anything. Oh, uh, I can't. Like on his head or only where he's touching the sheets? I don't know. I, I always notice when he like wakes up, like he's got little yeah. beads of sweat on his nose. Yeah. 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 And how's his growth? Um, he's by the eyeball. He looks pretty he's, good. He's, I mean, he yeah, he's under the first person. Yeah. You guys are my fifth people, so yeah. he is not destined yeah. to be a large he's, uh, he's under the first percentile, but he's following his own curve. Oh, he's parallel to the. Yeah. We, we worked hard on getting his feeding up to snuff. And so, and there are some signs that sleep might be impacted. That little bit of sweating, um, maybe some, you know, some. Management of oral secretions and, and feeding that suggests that he might be prone to either aspirating during sleep or just obstructing his airway with all that accumulated. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm always in favor of doing a sleep study in kids who can't do a pulmonary function test. So mm -hmm. It would be a reasonable thing to do. And then having to read it with a with finely tuned eye toward the you know, muscular issues. We still, we still nap them. Of twice a day, mm -hmm. and like, I guess I don't know if it's a I assume he's using maybe not more muscle, but more uh, effort to sit to, you know, and uh, on a regular basis, right? Trying to attribute it to that, but yeah, it could be that there's some good, good chunks of sleep uh, throughout the day. So that's another thing to, to think about is that if he has some difficulty with breathing during his sleep, could treating that make his daytime function, his therapies, his development that much better? Right. Can we maximize his potential by getting him good rest? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, we're going to read this. Bring our heads. Oh, yeah. Bring our heads. Yeah. Michigan. People outside of Michigan like that don't get that. It was either Iowa or Michigan in my mind. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think those are two different places. Yeah, for us. That's for us here. Yes. I hear your rabbits are like, which one do we see? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I'm not hearing this. <laughs> On the other hand, I, I had to confirm what like, state I'm in. So. <laughs> I'm clearly not in the right state of mind, is the only state I know. Uh, yeah, so I, I think seeing your local. The actual formula is making sure that you can get a sleep study would be completely reasonable. So, do you have seen them, right? No, we have seen them. We'll see them in September. Okay. And this, is that a Michigan Children's CS model or is that it? Oh, uh, we're at so Helen DeVos Children's Hospital, Hospital okay. is in Grand Rapids. Grand Rapids. So, that's where we're seeing our neuromuscular clinic. Okay. Okay. If I have questions, I can reach out for some of these if they want to. So are you, do you, this is something that always, it's an excellent question and it's something that always comes up is, you know, when, if you have a child like yeah. your son who, who, you know, they're too young, we know they're at risk, they're too young to do a sleep study, or it's, they're too young to do pulmonary function testing yeah. or anything like that. When do you do the first sleep study, and is there any utility still to doing home oximetry and just doing that as a, you know, as a sort of first pass at? It doesn't replace the other, but right. does it give you? It certainly gives me a piece, some peace of mind um, yeah. when a kid is screaming loudly and growing well and looks okay. When do you do yeah. that first right. sleep study? So I will tell you, my suspicion for sleep disorder breathing for your child is relatively low. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's a great question. When do we time our sleep studies? Um, so I'm meeting you now, so now. Uh, but that's, <laughs> that's, but, that's, but that's, that's not sorry. that's not a real answer. <laughs> right. Then it sort of comes right. back to yeah. us, you know, when do we send you to the pulmonologist? Yeah. And although I, it was I think sent in children who um, 
you can't get any objective data any other way, I'm much more likely to get a sleep study. Do you, in so order you to do it at three data. months? Do you do it at six months? If I would, you diagnose it, you know, yep. they had a prenatal ultrasound yeah. that showed brain problems, so they mm -hmm. were they were given the diagnosis pretty early. So probably not as early as three months, unless. I'm looking at a child who clearly has breathing. Right. Um, so we're we're going so, to assume it's the asymptomatic yeah. kid who we know is at so risk. I'm, I'm using the bigger, the so, bigger and with, without without trying to make you feel like you missed anything. Oh, no. Please understand that. Somewhere <laughs> somewhere around <laughs> somewhere around a year old. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. So somewhere around a year old, I think it's reasonable to ask the question. Um, sleep studies in infants are challenging because infants read funny is the best I can understand from the literature. Mm -hmm. they, have a lot of, they have a lot of movements, frankly, that are normal. They have a lot of respiratory patterns that are considered normal. But if they're read uh, with an eye towards either sleep apnea or just children's breathing to and above, then they can be read as extremely abnormal. And so it's probably fine. So that's why I wait in that first year of life unless I absolutely have to. Yeah. In terms of home oximetry, um, so if it's normal, I'm not reassured. And if it's abnormal, then you need a sleep study to find what's going on. So I would skip that step. If you can get into a pediatric sleep, I'll just do that. So, so during, during that, I know some, our pulmonologists often will use have home oximetry available during that first year in a kid who is otherwise yeah. healthy. Um, and I think there's quite a bit of, of variability. Russ, when do you, do you have a sense of, I'm not sure I have a good sense of I've the answer to my question. Home oximetry, yeah, what yeah, about our sleep too. study? I, I sort of have to, in sort of otherwise more like a yeah. kid, I, I wait until they break away from that pattern, unless there's something else right. going on. But if they're healthy and growing and eating. Yeah. What, what's that to make it? Oxygen monitoring. It's just oxygen monitoring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, you can do those overnight. Yeah. Just you can do it at home and just wear it. Right. Um, I start with the Utah sort of 4,500 feet elevation and yeah. it won't drop down. <laughs> so yeah, I, we're, we're a little higher than that and I accept. My, my standards are very high. <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, I don't accept that. And I will find that out of the doubt. That's a laziness on my part. But it's growing well, vocalized as well. Right. Uh, swallowing okay. I, 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 it doesn't throw too many red flags in my brain. Uh, I, I tend to agree with you. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I'm kind of the last stop for that. So I have to maybe be a little bit <laughs> more. Aggressive about so that's it. Like by the time you reach me, I'm like, oh, then we gotta get this out. <laughs> that's sort of what I feel like yeah. it is. It's like when we refer to the pulmonologist, they will do a sleep study. Because right. that's kind and of what so, we're thinking you want, and we're right. thinking, and I have no other way of getting I'm, any more data than a neurologist who can take a terrific history just like I can. Like, <laughs> so that's the reason for the question. It's sort of, so uh, a good sort of way to think about medicine in general. You go to neurology and get an MRI and EG. <laughs> right, right. It's, it's, it's going to be hard to walk away without those two things. <laughs> but so we see the world through a lens. Uh, I think that's actually good just for family centers. We all see the world through kind of a lens. And hopefully, you guys are the ones seeing the whole picture and can help us when we're missing stuff or we're only looking through our lens. So, so, what I would do if you came to my clinic and said, Listen, I think we could get a sub study to get some objective data, do we have to? So if you want to do it, let's do it. And if not, we can talk about about it again the next time it comes to this. That's okay. So if it's something we want to do, we should push for it when we meet yeah. in September. Yeah. yeah. And if you add an age, it would be reasonable to get a baseline. Yeah. If it's right. if it's flat out stone cold normal, and I'll go through and I can. In, I'm very curious about hearing him respond to what I say here. But flat out stone cold normal, which it virtually never is, it is very reassuring. It will, it may very well, because the pediatric criteria are so stringent, yes. that it may very well show mild obstructive sleep apnea. And then the pulmonologist will say, well, do you want to start BiPAP or not? Absolutely. And so 
and then it may show you know moderate to severe in which case then it's not really a discussion and we would make a recommendation but but my experience in these and Russ please chime in with you in these kids who are doing fine we send to the pulmonologists they do a sleep study we find 2.4 ethnic it's and yeah. it's so strictly speaking, if you were an adult, it would be like nothing. Mm -hmm. But by the pediatric criteria, then they have to call it mild to moderate sleep apnea. And then, then you've got this thing on your chart. So, yeah, so the, the, the reason we call it, we would call something 2.4 mild sleep apnea is because the long term consequence of that when you are two is different than when you're 60. Right? That's mm -hmm. 60 extra years, 58 extra years of mild sleep apnea that could in fact be further development. Uh, so, so I actually think the adults under call sleep apnea just let us have cardiovascular risk. Right? Oh, you, you, you stop reading 10 times an hour. Good for you. I, I don't think that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I, I think the criteria for children are, are more stringent because we keep in mind what the child's potential is. So I think it's more respectful to the human who have a sleep study than, than what the adult criteria do. And they'll argue that the outcomes are well, whatever. That's the problem. <laughs> um, so, so, but, but I agree with you that uh, an obstructive apnea index of two, I don't know what to do with. So if we're not seeing daytime impact, and, and I'm not a sleep doctor, so if you ask Dr. Pasco who is a sleep doctor, he would potentially be more aggressive. Um, so I would say if you're not seeing any any daytime issues, his growth and development seem optimized, then I would say or offer to say. Is that your experience too, Russ? And the, the kid who's pretty much normal. Do you? I pretty infrequently find dramatically abnormal sleep studies yeah. in a kid I don't expect it. Yeah, yeah. 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 you do find a dramatically abnormal. We don't have we don't have one in our field, right? How else we do with that? Oh, yeah. But I tend to be wanting to not do things as long as you're. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You and when things deviate from that, kid do a lot of things that we can deal with. And so, what's higher than that? The other lower than that? Um, more abnormal. More abnormal. <laughs> <Those numbers. laughs> when there are, like, because that's kind of been my decision making criteria, because there is so many things pulling at us, right? Mm -hmm. like, is there a course of action to take? Because, like, there's some tests we do, right? Where whether it's one thing or it's not. Like that's just that, right? Like, like another guy. Like yeah. it's just it, yeah, it is what you it know, is. We're yeah. putting him under for right. Just to know that his brain's not gonna change you know what I mean? Like there's nothing that we're gonna do to change what right. Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. But, well, okay, so this so he has two point four obstructions an hour tonight. Great. When do I reevaluate that? Is that yeah. just an annual thing? Mm -hmm. You know, guidelines um, suggest that you should do periodic evaluation, whatever that means. <laughs> <laughs> and some of it's dependent on how noxious the family and the child found the study. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, so periodic does that mean based on symptoms or based on you know developmental stage? But now they're going to school. We really need to know: is there going to be an impact of being more tired? Or Mental activity at school, mm -hmm. like all, all these things. That I, I don't know what periodic means. You know, the most, the strictest guidelines in neurovascular disease are in Duchenne, where they say annually do a sleep study after after you stop and walking. And literally, no one does that. Right? It's mm -hmm. impossible to do. Mm -hmm. To ask families to do that is just completely unreasonable and frankly cruel. Uh, <laughs> you are my new best friend. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it makes no sense to ask you guys to do all of this. Um, so I, I would say at some point in the future, regardless of what this sleep, sleep study, the first one ever that you chose, we will probably end up doing another one. Yeah. Pick, pick how you want to decide that with your pulmonologist yeah. and go forward and be confident in that decision. Yeah. They'll, they'll let us 
monopolize the conversation yeah. just because they're in the room too. So yeah, no, I'm I'm not in the long thing in the same thing. I mean, I don't really, I've mm -hmm. never. We were worried about her breathing in general just when COVID happened, but we didn't have any other um, specific symptoms or anything about sleeping. But I, I mean, I never even considered getting a sleep study done. So it will be something that we'll we'll talk to our uh, our uh, primary care physician about and just kind of see where that goes. And, and Bill, how old is your daughter? She's four. Um, the only thing that has ever come up is she started, and we think it might be an acid reflux thing, when she wakes up, I don't know, maybe once or twice a week, she throws up immediately upon waking up. Um, but if she sleeps through the night, she naps, like she's not sweating or anything un overly. But um, yeah, every once in a while, she'll throw up when she wakes up, just. And, and does she get feeds overnight? She to get what? She eats by mouth, right? She eats by mouth, yes. Okay. Yeah, morning vomiting. Boy, that sucks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I think you're right to pursue reflux. So you asked, and I don't think anybody answered, uh, uh, if there sure. is if the sleep study were greatly abnormal, yeah. is there a response? Yes, there is a response. And it would be what was being talked about, a BiPAP mask, it looks like a CPAP mask, yeah. only it's different. Okay. I mean, if the mask is the same, the machine is stupid. Okay. Yeah. And so, um, so I, I want to go back to a mildly abnormal sleep study. That's actually what I want to find in in some cases, what I really want is a normal sleep study. Yeah. That's almost impossible. What's your problem? <laughs> yeah. that, that's almost impossible to obtain, and I'm probably ordering too many sleep studies if I get normal ones. Um, so I would like to, in a, in a child who I suspect may develop sleep problems, I want to catch it early. So I want to see a mild, I don't want the first sleep study to be an oh shit moment, mm -hmm. right? I, I want it to be mildly abnormal say okay we have time to deal with this we can talk about this we don't have to jump on this right now but at least we're not behind so i actually prefer the sleep study that forces a conversation yeah and it's often reassuring as you yeah. say that yeah. we're not missing anything terrible that we need to be aggressive about right. right now and it also helps whatever that subsequent sleep study is say well we were here and now we're there that is now a trend that we either need to act on or continue to follow. Do you see with um with the alpha district like the, you know like you had mentioned with the retinal issues usually you can see that there's like structural damage from the beginning so it's not like just occurs with you find the same thing with pulmonary function or no, no, because that's a muscle okay. so it's more it's the muscle, just like the muscles that we talked about otherwise. So the breathing problems do tend to develop over time. I mean, sometimes they would affect a child early or early on in the nursery or something, but but they can definitely, but it's not like you wake up one night or one morning and suddenly she's in trouble unless we miss the boat. <laughs> I, I think that, so yeah, you're right, but there is oftentimes a tipping point. So times of stress, whether it's illness or surgery or whatever, can yeah. kind of tip us over. There's also, um, in my mind, there's this idea that we have a lot of reserve in pulmonary function. Because sitting here, I can't possibly be using 100% of my pulmonary function. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to run away when I finally disagree with what you're chasing. You're at no risk. <laughs> I'm really right. slow. Evolutionary is running away from the line, right? right? So we have a ton of pulmonary reserve. So we're only going to see symptoms when that reserve is depleted. Mm -hmm. I want to catch it well before that depletion, but when we're on our way, to depletion. So, so sometimes it can feel like things happen suddenly because the degradation of lung function was happening and we didn't know it. In kids who are unable to verbalize too young or cognitively unable to do pulmonary function tests, it's really hard to, to get a trend to get a on those things. 
So that, that, again, that's where a sleep study with objective parameters can be helpful. A lot of those are. And we're in, obviously, we're doing like physical therapy, and we have um, things that we're doing to promote muscle function and posture and stuff like that. But I guess, is there anything specifically that we could, that we should be like targeting to help with that? I know um, his PT has already mentioned, like, you know, his, his chest flares out a little bit at the bottom and he's got the little kind of like tummy sits and stuff like that. So I'm, we're working on it, but I, is that something we should be doing more? I think, I think trying to prioritize, and, yeah. uh, you know, yeah, so. encouraging what he can do already, right? Like the, the driving his car and, you know, encouraging exploring and things like that. But then, you know, we have a standard um, mm -hmm. device and we also have a gate trainer. That we have used once. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will admit that. Yeah, so it's very tough to like exactly. figure out what, sleep study. what to prioritize, <laughs> right? And we don't, we're not trying to discount what our son will be able to achieve. But yeah, so it's like figuring out where to spend the time. Sure. So, do you do the physical therapist exercise? Or do you see a physical therapist? We see oh. weekly, we see a physical therapist. Um, and typically we were doing um, uh, one week in the water and one week um, just normal and the week that we were doing normally we usually use like the gate trainer there mm -hmm. um, and then do some other like um, working on like protective factors of like actually mm -hmm. like catching himself like all it's a big thing for us right now. He really doesn't care if he's lost. He just goes like, woo! And he enjoys it. But, but, you know, other than that, we'll be the first to admit that we are the worst at like doing his PT exercises at home. Um, you know, time in the day? Yeah, we both work full time, so then mornings are, are dedicated to getting ready mm -hmm. to go, and then once they get home, Work, it's you know, kind of routine of like dinner, time. Yeah, takes longer than yeah. Sure. normal kids. So, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, they find it hard to do time in the day to, mm -hmm. to do those exercises. Uh, congrats you because you were doing high different um, action with you. I have the appointments in, the, in their house, mm -hmm. so I go to the house to do the session. Yeah. And I can do this once, twice, four times a week as much as necessary. So it's kind of different. Yeah. So congrats for, for doing this job because I know it's, it's difficult and considering it's our child. So, um, is he able to stay in this kind of position alone or? Some device is how with the with a device, with yeah. Device. So like it's the standard has kind of the two big wheelchair wheels on either either side, and it tracks you mm -hmm. know anywhere is a AFO and immobilizers in it. Yeah. Um, and then the dispenser to yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And she is sorry. He is. <laughs> uh, is he um, training the gay ability? Um, he does. Uh, I can't do it on my own. Um, this book, I, who knows you guys? I don't know how you guys. You mean <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um, our legs? <laughs> <our, laughs> yeah, but um, so he will do it, but they cramped quite a bit. Um, helping his legs. Forward. Helping his legs forward. Um, but he's able to pedal himself. Um, Decently. Yeah, it, it was a little deceiving because when we were going to PT and he was in the <laughs> in the gait trainer and, and they were helping Trump, um, you know, you guys notice subtle differences and improvements and yes. and oh they're they're putting more weight through uh -huh. and like doing more pushing uh -huh. off. So I thought when I was getting down there to do it myself, I'm like, okay, you know, there's a lot of cramping that's going on for him. <laughs> um, wasn't as much him doing it as I initially had 
had suspected, I guess. Uh, sorry, I have two more questions because I have to yeah. <laughs> know what is in you. Um, is he has uh, sorry had he's had his um, has some spine deformity? Um, um, no. No scoliosis. No scoliosis. Okay. And he is able to cycle, to do to use an uh, cyclometer or a bicycle a bicycle? No, we haven't tried that. I will he's really haven't tried it. Yeah. So sorry. Yeah. He's two. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's two, but you know it's, it's like a sky of like a, in Brazil we have uh it's, it's like um a single ergometer. So we can uh, the, the 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 kid stay seated obviously, yeah. and we can uh, help on the leg movement okay. to simulate this yeah. or this yeah. pattern. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, because if it, this um, this dispositive, if we have the dispositive device, mm -hmm. for sure you will have here in the US. Um, I think it could be a, a way, uh, a simple, a simple way of training, because yeah. when you when you think about what are you doing, I think you are very great. Um, my recommendations uh, are try to uh, put him in a standing position every day, if possible. Yeah. So it's well recommended to stay in the right position. So I don't know if you can do this yeah. daily and mm -hmm. for how long? I, when we were better about doing it, he was doing it for about 45 minutes at a time. Okay, so um, you know, um, 60 minutes, it's very good to bone density and mm -hmm. bone issues. And one hour and a half is a very good time considering the, the, the shortenings and the strength. The strength, oh, sorry, the stretching, sorry. Yeah. The stretching management. So we can have this, 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 this number in mind. You know, it's just a target for mm -hmm. something to, to reach. Okay. So we can um, try to. Um, I, I can't say guarantee, but we are trying to, to to manage the bone aspect because it's very important, and the joint development is it happens when we are in the right position, and do the exercise because it's too much to play. I know you you do this with him, and I don't know. I, I think you can recommend. Um, if it's possible, uh, a, a cycling exercise. Uh, I think some possibilities. Yeah. I don't remember having any of our PTs have kids have a home cycling machine that they use in this age. So I'm not impressed. You? We haven't. We've done. We've definitely done cycling in older kids. Right. And I love it because you can get up upright and we're actually doing it a little bit. It's mm -hmm. a great exercise. Um, but I think just that foot, that yeah. sort of I, I, I know the patterning of brain development is good. Yeah, it's like the train, okay? You, you need some uh, help, some um, help with the leg movements. Mm -hmm. But it's it's great that uh, he will grow up and see other right. kids doing the same. So it'd be very good. Maybe okay, two and a half. Maybe, but in three years, certainly he will. I can, uh, I can see it working from the perspective of um, a deep trainer. Obviously, take a great amount of force to be able to pedal yourself for little reward, right? Like. Uh, if you had a more seated posture, kind of, I think it was a rowing machine, but cycling trainer, right? Like, mm -hmm. you see him, one enjoying it, two using it. Um, and that's the other, you bring up a good point that we've talked about that you know, we are very fortunate in having our 
our uh, both of our parents watch him five days a week, which is amazing. But we also it makes us hold back on asking for other things, right? Like yeah. get it, get him in a stander, get him, <laughs> and they're and they're intimidated by it. But the in home, we've talked about it a little bit. Either working with local university students that are studying PT, right, and want to make money, or uh, just someone who can do, like, get him in those situations. And, so yeah. I, I, before, I mean, you said five days a week. Um, you yeah. described what it takes to get him in the standard. Yeah. You have your day, you have, he has to eat, he has to play with his sibling, mm -hmm. he has to have a bath, he has to get rid of his book, and then he has to go to bed, and there <laughs> aren't, there isn't another extra that much time in the day. So, right. so, I think your original question is, given that we have to prioritize, yeah. um, what would be, I mean, I think three times a week, if he's in a standard once a week at PT and then a couple times on the weekend or something like that, would probably, from my perspective, if I were talking to you, I would say that's spectacular. Yeah. And as long as he tolerates, so if he tolerates yeah. 45 minutes, he tolerates 45 minutes, that's spectacular, he's too. So would you disagree with that, or what? No. What is your? Um, no, because I think that we, I think we sometimes put demands on families that are unachievable in the real world, <laughs> yeah. and, and then we produce guilt and feel like mm -hmm. that's not. So I, I want to. So if you, if that would be your ideal, what would be your sort of? This would be a real target for two working parents who have two kids, one of whom's 15 months, one of whom's two years, and, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and are trying to also get the kids to bed. <laughs> well, I know it's really um, Actually, that's a, the purpose is not to, to you know, increase your obligations right. in a day. Um, it's actually, it's uh, the opposite because sometimes if we can uh, do the therapy more more fun, mm -hmm. I think it would be great. For example, okay, now I have to stop and do some exercise. Okay, well, what are gonna do? Stretch, exercise, or cycling? For the kid, it would be much better. Yeah. So it's a way of turn the you know, the activity, and uh, we we therapists uh, recommend exercise, but uh, it's for example it will depends on the week. Now in this week we are only uh, we will have only one day to do this. Okay, yeah. that's fine. Mm -hmm. Or oh, in another uh, in the other week we will travel to spend time with the family. That's okay. So many times I receive this kind of message. That's okay if my child um, doesn't uh, do the physical practice in this week. That's okay. Oh, but in this week we will have three or four, you know, because I am on a vacation, I will, I will have a free time. So I will try to, to, to do this. So uh, the idea is, is just uh, when, when could be possible to do this. Mm -hmm. so, Does he roll or scooch around the house? Does he get around the house on his own at all? Or is just, the car, the just the car. Just the car. Yeah, but mm -hmm. we try to. And um, just one more thing. If you have to priorize with one thing, now what's the, the most important thing? It's uh, the standing position. Just standing. That's good to hear because I, I honestly, it's one of the things where it seems, you know, to the parents that it's the least productive, right? He can't go anywhere. He can't, there's not much room to play with. We need, and that's on us, right? We need to build a little, you know, we're looking at moving and kind of like building some more things around the home that are the size, this heights and sizes that would be mm -hmm. ideal for him. But, uh, you know, I, was, I was just thinking, could he do dinner in the stay here? Like, could it be up here? Yeah. I built a tray for it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you're kind of multi purpose, right? Yeah. But yeah. it's still so getting yeah. better. And, and yeah. Yeah. As they get older for the standard, you can use books, yeah. screen time. Yeah, screen, screen time. Yeah, it's just about three minutes of three yeah. You have to be careful with the screen time. That's your goal. That is it. Yeah. 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 That's your prize for doing it for a while. Yeah. 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 Okay, we were going to get by with that goal in the day. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
the screen time of the reward for everything. Yeah, that's a tough one with, you know, we have five of yeah. us and all the older brothers, like the oldest is 13. So they're really into that screen time right now. Well, yeah. And, uh, I think it's a little harder to be younger for this game. Right? But if that yeah. can be his yeah. 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 sign. Not as much as his father. But if that can be his sign. If there's dinosaurs on the screen or... <laughs> 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 yeah. It's funny, he, he kind of likes the movie Cars, the anime. Oh. But he really let, like, I watch a lot of YouTube car videos of real cars. He loves that. Like, He'll watch it all day long. Um, there, are, there are worse things you yeah. could have said. So I, I'm not looking at that. Um, <laughs> right. It's been 10 minutes for the lunch. I need to go buy. Yeah. I have a lot of time with that. And you can find a guy in a wheelchair who does wheels. This is his name. You don't know if you guys may have seen him before. He's like, he does tricks. He does tricks. He goes on ramps and stuff like that. And has no regard for his own safety <laughs> at all. Right, that might not be the robot. I mean, I mean, that's all extreme athletes. <laughs> but yeah, and that's it's a good reminder. Uh, just something we haven't thought about it a lot. Like, the, the one uh, for X-rays, like we know he has like, one, one leg that's a little longer than the other one, just from that, not placing pressure, not pressure on it. Uh, and the other thing is to remember that no matter what you do, there are some things that are just disease progression that you cannot, you cannot right. change. Yeah. And so, you know, if you develop scoliosis, if you develop osteoporosis, if you develop other mm -hmm. things, it's not because you just didn't stand it. Right, but it's, mm -hmm. it's hard to simply try to minimize, delay. Yep. Oh, I guess I have a, this is like a really simple question. Oh, Bill? I have one. I know there, there's an endocrinologist in there. I know you mentioned that uh, your son is also way below the uh, first percentile in height and weight. Um, one of the studies that I was um, reading, one of the uh, patients was treated with a growth hormone. Um, is that something? Because Nova is walking, but she has trouble with stairs. A lot of it's because she's tiny. She looks and she's wearing, you know, clothes of a two-year-old. And she walks into her classroom. She's half the size of the other preschoolers. She looks like a really advanced infant walking around. So I, I, it, it's funny, but her, her classmates treat her like a baby. Where she isn't, and if if we could get her height up a little bit, and I I don't know if if that is just something to learn to accept, or is that something that can be treated? This is so I'm just going to give them a little background because they weren't here this morning. So this is a um, very rare form of muscular dystrophy that short stature and extreme growth failure is part and parcel of the disease. I have no idea whether or not um, growth hormone, in general, we don't do growth hormone in our diseases, but with this particular one, I don't, I think it would take somebody, I mean, Kiara might have some ideas about the underlying, what we know about the pathophysiology and whether growth hormone would be something that might be effective or not. Growth hormone has potential side effects. Um, so I would consider it with caution, um, but it's a, it, your the only. Yeah, the only reason that I had really thought of it is, you know, there's only two studies about this disease that I've been able to find. And one of them specifically mentions the short stature was treated with growth hormone. However, there was no follow up on it and no way to find out who this kid was or what went on with it. So, um, so I know our experience, which is with this disease, is a handful of patients with Duchenne who got growth hormone. I had one kid who was like growth hormone deficient and saw the endocrinologist and had testing and was deficient. We very gently gave him a little bit of growth hormone and did okay. But with Duchenne, you can definitely make worse muscle by growing it bigger. So I think that's a good one to talk with a good endocrinologist who's willing to read and 
just get into the literature and think about it. And I would I would talk to Kiara about that too because I think she probably has the best understanding of the molecular pathogenesis yeah. and that's and because of it, this is an insulin receptor interacting, I think that the the molecular pathogenesis is different than than most of what we are used to. And I I think so. so you need to talk to several really smart people. Um, yeah. and try to learn as much as you can before considering it, but yeah. it is, I mean... A good metabolic genesis might be another person to bring into that conversation. So the person who recorded this gene was in here this morning. Oh. And she's, so she's a PhD who knows, who, who knows the pathophysiology the and, but yeah. Um, I was thinking in terms of, and in terms of adaptive kinds of things. I don't, you may have already done this. You might look at the achondroplasia literature and see what patients with achondroplasia. So achondroplasia is a totally unrelated genetic disorder, but people are very short and they're normal, but they're very short. And so in terms of how do they function in the world, like climbing stairs and things like that, that might be a patient population that would give you some help on how to function in the world, how she, to help her function in the world. Thank you. Yeah, we're, we've, we've been modifying things in our house as much as we can. Like she wants to be able to move around the house. She can't reach high enough to open doors and she can't use the regular size bathroom on her own and the stairs we, we built another uh, railing that's lower for her and she's usually just slides down them anyway but one of the physical therapy things we've been doing is having her practice go up and down them so having that railing so she can do it on her own but you might, just looking yeah look at the achondroplasia stuff because they that is an entire patient community and it's not that uncommon yeah. That yeah, they have, so you're not needing to completely reinvent the wheel because they have grown up living this life of being very short and how they so or function in the world. Yeah. Thank you. Theo should not get the growth hormone unless he were to have growth the rest. We're, we're pretty, I mean, clearly the. The stature is not the genetic potential. Not the same, it's not but, to be six five. But um, <laughs> yeah, we're we're okay with short stature. Yeah. Um, yeah. Other questions from either of you? I don't know, I'm not sure right now. This is this has been fantastic. Just hearing other people's experiences and looking into these things. I just one thing I was going to say on the PT question is, I find that I have families that are really like all out, and they're doing PT a few times a week, and of course they're doing pool therapy. There's a really diminishing return for all that, right? And I, I sort of like the idea of being goal directed. Mm -hmm. being, uh, what do we want this child to do that they can't do? How can we help them to do it? And even just doing bursts of more focused PT based on those things, or, just, or speech, or OT, whatever. And just being thoughtful about what you want the goals to be and, and working on those things. Sometimes it's uh, okay if the other things get back to you for a minute. And you can accept that now is the time that you're going to have the most intensive therapies. Yeah, so yeah they'll smooth out. And then as, a, as he gets older, priorities change. Yeah. The frequency will like At this young age, a lot of those goals are developmental. Yeah. Yeah. They just they sort of fit the little milestones that you're trying to, to get, yeah. and then that catches up. I think that. Um, I think we both accepted the fact that him ever ambulating is probably not in the cards, but for your POMP 1, 2, do you have any ambulators or? I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think, um, oh, I guess that was another 
Um, I guess I know we want to get a more into his standard and stuff like that. Um, interest, like, this was just a, I think this was just a bad experience for me, but um, when we went to see one of our ortho, the orthopedic doctor, um, he had just, I think he was just like kind of like thinking out loud or maybe not explaining himself well enough, but he mentioned the fact that like, if he were to develop um, hip dysplasia and he doesn't become ambulatory, like, oh, we'd probably just leave him out. Like we wouldn't relocate them. And I right. totally agree with them. Okay. So yeah. I don't it's not, it, most of the time kids who are weak, their hips sit out of sight. Okay. And, they just, and they create a little happy place and they are hurt and they just okay. and we're happy with that. Because and if you saw the work of thing, mm -hmm. if if you do need to go in and do something, it's big hairy surgery mm -hmm. and it's non trivial. And so you have to have a clear benefit. And if the hip is sitting out there and it looks fine, it's just sitting there happy as a clam and the patient is in no pain and they it's not affecting any function, you're not gonna make it better mm -hmm. by doing big hairy surgery. Mm -hmm. You might make it worse. And you can mm -hmm. definitely make the patient worse. worse. So mm -hmm. that's the reason that he said that. The vast majority of our patients who have neuromuscular weakness, and feel free to disagree with me guys, mm -hmm. um, if the vast majority who have neuromuscular weakness, I don't even look at their hips unless they're asking, unless they're starting to complain about mm -hmm. pain and it seems like it's something that we can't fix with positioning mm -hmm. and things like that, and we're thinking that we need to do a steroid injection we need to do something else, and then we might look. Okay. But we do not routinely follow it because... So it's kind of something that just naturally happens on its own? Because or? you don't have the muscle strength mm -hmm. holding that hip in, and you don't have the normal um, pressures and gravity and the, the uh, mechanical pressure building that acetabulum mm -hmm. to fit the head of the finger in. So that's for being in a standard course. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. that, that mechanical stress and Tell the session, tell the hips to develop, but if he's not going to walk, then it, I wouldn't focus on what the measure looks like. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I have the same opinion of what it is to be dual corrected. Yeah. What do we want to accomplish by this surgery? Right hip surgery when they're out, you have a really good reason to do and it. And not just that the only out. reason is that I've ever seen anybody do anything mm -hmm. is pain. If yeah. somebody has pain that yeah. is not managed by positioning, sometimes a steroid injection, and, and this is a minority of our patients um, who end up having that kind of pain. Do you ever see scoliosis develop from hip asymmetry? It's the other way, usually, right? Scoliosis the causes the hips. Hip hip causes the pelvic yeah. liquidity. The scoliosis causes pelvic, yeah. pelvic liquidity that makes Challenges yeah. for our friend and yeah. we're trying to get seating. That's always the, the debate. Did the spine cause the hip problem? Did it cause the spine problems? It seems like the spine causes. Yeah, it's not really, and that's not the hip dislocation. That's, that's, that's the pelvis the yeah. tilted, yeah. so you're sitting more on one side. Yeah. I guess that would be a good question to ask too, because he does have some leg length. Discrepancies and and so when he is in a standard, like we can tell when he's getting fatigued because his hip is up and he's, you know, I, I don't know what he's like. His, his body's like curved. So I mean, is that going to lead to scoliosis? Like, is that going to be negative or is that just like when we see him doing that, maybe that's just our sign that he's done? Yeah. Um, to me, I guess the question is, is there really a leg length discrepancy or are the hips? It's a hands are one of those little hard hands higher than the other. This is pelvis twisted. And the only way you can tell whether there's a leg length discrepancy is to take, have an orthopedist take a leg length x-ray with the specific question of, is there a leg length discrepancy? And then they measure from mm -hmm. the bony point and the femur to the knee and knee to the ankle. And you can't do it on 
I know we did the x-ray, but I don't, maybe we, maybe it wasn't the leg length one, because I do know that when we went, I was like, that was my concern, because that was initially why we were referred to the organ, because it was like, they didn't not walking the very right the yeah. And they were like, so we asked the question, is there stuff going on with, like, with his hips, did everything yeah. seated yeah. properly? Well, I got there, they said yes. They did the hips and the back x ray, like, wait, but the leg length, and they're like, yeah, no, we don't really. <laughs> that's yeah, that's no. what you're getting from us too. <laughs> yeah, right. We are not very excited about like being described. Well, yeah. And it will not being at a standard and you want his bones to be yeah. maybe important to know. Because then you can level mm -hmm. his legs so he doesn't Usually you can see that the PTs are really good at yeah. seeing yeah. that in position. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We also there for the legs. It's measured the And I hope to be there. I mentioned it to my wife, so I, we're we're definitely going to talk to you next week. <laughs> okay, excellent. It would be a slightly bigger alpha district icon if we grew there. <laughs> yeah. How how what is the size? Well, we've typically? we've got about a hundred people, I think, signed up the last time. Okay. But and some are virtual, some are. I think it's more than that, like hundred thirty or maybe I don't know, but. Some are virtual. We've got every continent, almost every continent, wow. covered on the virtual side. Wow. Wow. To visit us, side. Um, so, who knows how many people, you know, at the last minute, people get COVID, their grandmother gets COVID and they yeah, saw it yesterday. Um, you know, things change at the last minute. But it's Historically, we've had up to like 150 people, and not all that's patients and family members. Um, but again, to make sure that you guys are aware that a lot of them will have one hurdle. Mm -hmm. So we're we're trying desperately to bring in more kids. We want them. <laughs> and is, so is one hurdle. Attributed to one specific so gene, then or? the vast majority are the are FKRP. So among okay. all the dyslexicopathies, about sixty percent of our patient population has FKRP mutations, okay. and most of those are um, of a lingering type. Okay. 